A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. If you are a parent of any kind, to a child or a pet, there are bound to be times when you doubt your parenting skills and question your choices. There is also a likely moment where you may ask yourself why you wanted kids in the first place. But then you take a deep breath and remember how much you love them and all is forgiven. No parent or child is perfect, but there are some things that a parent can do that are unforgivable. We've talked about how abuse affected some of the killers covered in previous episodes and how the childhood trauma caused by physical, sexual, and emotional abuse can shape someone's future. But what about the parent whose pattern of abuse ends with the death of their children? Nine times. Mary Beth and Joe Tinning had nine children, and none of them lived beyond the age of four and a half. The victims bore none of the typical signs of physical abuse. No bruises, no broken bones. The children's death were all attributed to sickness and disease. Many felt sympathy for the couple and believed they were cursed. They had sympathy, I should say, until it was revealed that it was not sickness or disease that killed their children. The culprit was actually their own mother, Mary Beth Tinning. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Mary Beth Tinning. Cynthia, get over here right away. There's something wrong with Tammy Lynn. Those were the words Cynthia Walker heard when she picked up the phone at 1.15 in the morning on December 20th, 1985. Cynthia was a licensed nurse, and she reacted like one during an emergency. She rushed across the wet, snowy street in her nightgown and bedroom slippers to her neighbor, Mary Beth Tinning's home. Mary Beth and her husband, Joe, and their newborn daughter, Tammy Lynn, lived in a duplex directly across the street from Cynthia and her family in a quiet, Schenectady, New York neighborhood. The family had met that summer when a pregnant Cynthia noticed that her new neighbor, Mary Beth, was also expecting a child and introduced herself. The women became fast friends, They grew so close that she even trusted Mary Beth to babysit her five-year-old son. And Mary Beth shared with Cynthia that she and her husband had lost children to natural causes. After both women delivered healthy babies and they spent more time together, Cynthia grew increasingly wary of Mary Beth's behavior. Although Tammy Lynn was not her first baby, Mary Beth seemed frazzled every time Tammy Lynn cried. Cynthia observed that Mary Beth prepared her daughter's formula in the morning and then left the bottles out on the counter all day. When Cynthia warned her that the milk needed to be refrigerated, Mary Beth scoffed and said it was more convenient to leave it out. 
And then there was Tammy Lynn's severe diaper rash, something that could develop into a bad infection if left untreated. Multiple times, Cynthia showed her friend how to apply diaper cream to the inflamed areas, but the rash never healed. While she still found Mary Beth friendly, she realized this was a deeply troubled woman. When Cynthia entered the Tinning's second floor apartment in the middle of the night after receiving the frantic call, four-month-old Tammy Lynn was lying on the changing table in the living room. She was purplish blue and not breathing. Her arms were stretched above her head and she was completely still. Cynthia scooped her up and laid her on the floor, immediately administering CPR. Mary Beth just paced back and forth, repeatedly exclaiming that she, quote, found her that way. Joe Tinning, dressed in street clothes, stood a few feet back, silently shaking his head. Cynthia was furious that neither Mary Beth or Joe had been administering CPR when she arrived. Mary Beth had worked as a nurse's aide for several years before taking other jobs as a waitress, school bus driver, and clerical worker. That means Mary Beth had been trained by the American Heart Association to never stop administering CPR until the medical emergency workers show up and take over. When Tammy Lynn arrived at the ER, the doctors tried to revive her, but it was too late. Mary Beth recounted the same story that she had told Cynthia. She found Tammy Lynn in her crib, tangled in her sheets, not breathing. When she rolled her over, there was a spot of blood on the bedding. The nurses and doctors at St. Clair's were devastated. They knew Tammy Lynn. She had been born in their maternity ward. But they also knew the story that Mary Beth told about discovering her child not breathing. They knew it because they'd heard it many times before from her. Tammy Lynn was the ninth child of Mary Beth and Joseph Tinnings to die. This time, one of the nurses called the police. The first of the children to die was Jennifer. Born on December 26, 1971, she had contracted meningitis in utero. Mary Beth admitted that she had tried to induce labor herself by inserting a sharp foreign object into her uterus. Why? So that the baby would be born on Christmas. Instead, she probably introduced the infection that caused Jennifer to pass away after only living eight days. An autopsy revealed she, in fact, had several abscesses on her brain. That same month, on January 20th, just 17 days after Jennifer's death, Mary Beth rushed her two-year-old son, Joseph, to the hospital. She said he had choked on his own vomit and had a seizure. The hospital kept Joseph for three hours and discharged him when they did not observe anything wrong. However, a few hours later, Mary Beth brought Joseph back unconscious. She claimed he told her he was tired, so she put him down for a nap, and when she checked on him, she found him, and I quote, blue and tangled up in his sheets. Since no one but Mary Beth had witnessed Joseph's seizures, the doctors recorded Joseph's inexplicable cause of death as cardiorespiratory arrest. No autopsy was performed. Seven weeks later, on March 4, 1972, four-year-old Barbara, the eldest of the Tinning children, was rushed to the hospital after Mary Beth said she, too, suffered a seizure. The hospital 
concerned by Joseph's recent death, wanted to keep Barbara for observation. But strangely, Mary Beth refused. When Mary Beth brought Barbara back just a couple of hours later, she was unconscious. The emergency room personnel resuscitated her and admitted her to the ICU. But she died within hours. An autopsy was performed on Barbara. Because she had suffered convulsions and fever while at the hospital, the doctors attributed her death to Ray's syndrome, a rare but devastating disease that causes swelling in the brain and liver damage. This began a pattern that repeated itself six more times. That same year, Mary Beth quickly became pregnant with her fourth child, another son. She gave birth to him in November of 1971, but the very next month, she rushed her newborn, unconscious, to the ER, where he was pronounced dead. His death was attributed to sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS. The ER doctor who tried to save her son did not know about the other tinning deaths, and no autopsy was performed, even though the doctor reported the unexplained death to the medical examiner. The medical examiner failed to alert his superior. Two years later, in 1974, Joseph Tinning, Mary Beth's husband, said his food was tasting bitter. His family, who was suspicious of Mary Beth, urged him to get tested. He resisted until he was admitted to the hospital and they found a near fatal dose of barbiturates in his system. It was later discovered that Mary Beth had stolen a bottle of medicine from her nephew and had mixed the entire bottle into Joseph's food. Joseph, however, refused to press charges. The Tinning's fifth baby, another son, was born on March 30th, 1975. He was five months old when an ambulance rushed his lifeless body to the ER at a different hospital from where her other children had been treated. Mary Beth said she had been driving with him in the car when she heard him gurgle and then witnessed him turn blue. This time, an autopsy was performed. And not knowing the family history, the death was attributed to acute pulmonary edema, which is a condition caused by excess fluid in the lungs, making it hard to breathe. This condition, by the way, can be caused by many factors, including suffocation. In 1978, Mary Beth gave birth to her sixth child, a girl. That daughter was only three and a half months old when she died. And nine months later, Mary Beth gave birth to baby number seven, a boy. He too died at three and a half months old. Mary Beth claims to have found both of them blue and lifeless in their cribs. By 1981, the Tinnings still had one child at home. Two-year-old Michael had been adopted in the summer of 1978, just before their sixth child was born. Since he was not biologically related, it was assumed that Michael would be protected from the Tinnings' family curse. After all, if something happened to Michael, it would be obvious there wasn't an elusive death gene killing the Tinning children, as Mary Beth claimed. But in late February 1981, the Tinning curse appeared to strike again when Michael fell down the family's back staircase as he tried to greet the mailman. An ambulance was called to their apartment to treat the boy for facial cuts and a minor concussion. At the time, doctors said he would be okay. 
A week later, at 7.30 a.m. on March 3rd, 1981, Mary Beth called her sister-in-law to say she, quote, couldn't wake Michael up. Her alarmed sister-in-law told her to get him to an ER at once. Now, at this time, Mary Beth and Joseph lived across the street from a hospital. She could have simply walked there. Instead, Mary Beth called the pediatrician a 10-minute drive away. She told the nurse that Michael wasn't feeling well, but did not say it was an emergency. The unsuspecting nurse told Mary Beth to bring Michael into the office at 10 a.m. When Mary Beth rushed into the pediatrician's office at 10 a.m., she was in hysterics. She was holding Michael in a blanket and screaming that he wasn't breathing. When the nurse unwrapped the blanket, she discovered to her horror that Michael was dead. She still administered CPR while someone called for an ambulance. Michael was rushed to St. Albany Medical Center, but they could not revive him. An autopsy was performed, and the pathologist noted acute pneumonia in one of his lungs, but it was not significant enough to cause his death. However, the pathologist feared that if this case wound up in court, the defense would look at this autopsy and claim that it could not be ruled out as a factor in Michael's death. So, he reported the cause of death as pneumonia. Mary Beth complained that family and friends viewed her suspiciously because of her children's deaths. Every time a child died, she and Joe moved, so she didn't have to deal with the neighbors. This may have been the reason why, when she found herself pregnant with her ninth and last child at age 42, she delayed contacting even her OBGYN until her fifth month. Tammy Lynn was born on August 22, 1985. Even though she presented as a normal, healthy baby, in light of the family history, the new pediatrician suggested that Mary Beth monitor her baby's sleep with an apnea alarm, which is a machine that monitors the baby's heart rate and breathing. If anything is amiss, the alarm sounds. Mary Beth refused, saying that it had not helped save her other children. And to be fair, she did have a point. How could that machine have saved them from the one woman that was supposed to have protected them? It was only after Tammy Lynn's death that Child Protective Services were finally called, and Mary Beth was arrested for second-degree murder. Mary Beth Rowe Tinning was born on September 11, 1942, in Dwaynesburg, New York, to Alton and Ruth Rowe. For the first few years of Mary Beth's life, Alton was deployed overseas with the United States Air Force, fighting in World War II. When he returned from the war, he got a job as a machine operator at a General Electric plant. Ruth worked in one of the many factories that recruited women workers during the war. Mary Beth was shuttled around to different relatives' homes during her parents' absences. One relative carelessly told the young Mary Beth that she was an unplanned pregnancy and implied that she was unwanted. The message permanently stuck with Mary Beth. She often told her brother, Alton Jr., who was six years younger, you were the one they wanted. According to Mary Beth, her father would beat her and lock her in a closet whenever she cried. Her parents were emotionally unavailable, and Mary Beth would later tell friends and co-workers 
that she had a very lonely childhood and rarely had playmates. Once, her parents ordered her to her room all day while they left the house. Dr. Becky Spellman, a leading psychologist in the UK, wrote about the effect that emotionally absent or unavailable parents can have on the development of their child. She said, and I quote, over time, as their children mature, encountering challenges in which they need reassurance, it can have a severe impact on their emotional well-being. In very early childhood, the problem isn't quite as apparent as newborn babies are inclined to cry until they get their needs met. However, once cognitive development begins and verbal communication becomes the norm by age five, the patterns of emotional neglect begin to take root. As a child notices, they will often receive either no response or an inconsistent one when engaging with their parents. They learn to keep their emotions to themselves. As you can probably guess, suppressing emotions can take a toll on a person's mental health. For Mary Beth, feelings of inadequacy and being unwanted continued through her teens. She reportedly made attempts to kill herself more than once. She graduated high school in 1961, and college was never a real consideration. Instead, she settled on work as a nurse's aide. In 1963, friends set Mary Beth up on a blind date with Joseph Tinning. Two years later, Joseph and Mary Beth were married. On May 31st, 1967, Mary Beth gave birth to Barbara Ann Tinning. Joseph Tinning Jr. followed on January 10th, 1970. Both were beautiful, healthy babies and blonde like their mother. Mary Beth's third pregnancy was difficult. She was often sick and needed her mother-in-law's help to care for Barbara and Joseph Jr. Mary Beth's own mother suffered from debilitating arthritis and therefore could not help her. In October 1971, Mary Beth's 54-year-old father suffered a heart attack at his job and died. Although he had been cruel and never told her he loved her, Mary Beth, who was seven months pregnant, was still distraught and overcome with grief. After Mary Beth gave birth to her third child, the one who contracted meningitis in utero and died days later, the nurses asked if she wanted to hold the baby one last time. She took the lifeless child under the bedsheets with her and stayed that way for quite a while. The nurses noted that she remained unemotional and continued to display a flat affect. At the time, postpartum depression was not really acknowledged as a medical disorder. The nurses might have thought that Mary Beth might just be keeping a stiff upper lip in the presence of her loss. And this was the way she was stealing herself to move forward. There is a difference between postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. According to the American Psychological Association, or the APA, postpartum depression occurs in one out of every seven women, but postpartum psychosis is very rare. The APA lists the symptoms of postpartum depression as frequent crying, anger, anxiety, withdrawal from loved ones, the feeling of numbness or being disconnected from the baby and even sometimes thoughts of hurting oneself or the infant. Those symptoms, they say, can appear days or months after childbirth and may have serious effects. This disorder can make it hard for a new mother to get through the day, and it can affect her ability to take care of her baby 
or herself. Postpartum psychosis, however, tends to occur within the first two to four weeks after delivery, and symptoms can include delusions or hallucinations. In addition to these symptoms, which are very severe, patients can also develop mood swings, paranoia, and periods of confusion. Mary Beth did not have postpartum psychosis, but it is likely she did have postpartum depression. However, that eventually evolved into a far more serious problem. Friends and family noticed Mary Beth seemed to change. They described the funeral service for the first child that died, which was held at the same site as her father's service, as both sad and, well, disturbing. There was an open casket with the infant surrounded by toys. Mary Beth stoically stood by the coffin and received everyone. Her behavior was even more strange at the post-funeral gathering at her home where Mary Beth moved about and greeted people like she was at a party. She would also go on a spending spree when the children's insurance payouts would come. Her sister-in-law told police that when one of her children's payments came in, Mary Beth casually told her, and I quote, she was going shopping for new drapes and wallpaper. The eight Tinning children's funerals that followed over the next 14 years were much the same. Each service had an open casket with the child lying amongst a pile of toys and a dry-eyed Mary Beth at the front of the receiving line. Police interviewed family, friends, co-workers, and neighbors and learned that within days of each child's death, Mary Beth packed up the toys, clothes, and baby furniture and donated them. When she would get pregnant again, she would go out and buy all new items. When friends and family members asked her why she kept having children if they obviously carried a defective gene, she responded she was a woman, and that is what women do. They have babies. Police noted similar patterns in each of the children's deaths. Hours before their deaths, Mary Beth would take the child into the hospital and claim that they had just suffered a seizure that only she witnessed. The hospital would observe the child, run lots of tests, and refer them to Boston Children's Hospital for several days of testing. Finding nothing abnormal, they would discharge the tinning baby and Mary Beth would take the baby home only to return hours later with an unconscious or dead child. Each time the story was familiar, she would set the child down in their crib and later find that they had turned blue and were unconscious in their crib. When Mary Beth Tinning's name is brought up, it's often followed by the term Munchausen by proxy. This syndrome is a rare form of medical abuse that involves someone close to the victim, usually a child or a disabled individual who is dependent on a caregiver. A report on ABC News said that the term Munchausen syndrome by proxy was first coined in 1977 by an English pediatrician, Roy Meadow. He said, Munchausen by proxy derives from Munchausen syndrome, in which the medical fabrication is self-directed and is named after a German cavalry officer, Baron von Munchausen, known for wild exaggerations. The exaggerator claims preposterous things to get attention from others. The most common scenario of Munchausen by proxy involves a parent who causes symptoms in the child and repeatedly takes the child to medical professionals with the goal of having procedures performed on their child. The caregiver exaggerates or fabricates an illness in the victim and then lies to others that they are trying to help. The caregiver may go as far as to cause the illness 
by poisoning or even suffocating the victim. They harm their child to gain sympathy and attention from others. I have seen cases where a mother actually injected some kind of infectant into the baby so the baby would be sick and then they'd rush them to the hospital. This illness is classified in the DSM as a FDIA or factitious disorder imposed on another. These disorders are considered a mental illness because they are associated with severe emotional difficulties. According to the Cleveland Clinic, quote, the exact cause of FDIA is not known, but researchers believe both biological and psychological factors play a role in the development of this disorder. Some theories suggest that a history of abuse or neglect as a child or the early loss of a parent might be factors in its development. Some evidence suggests that major stress, such as marital problems, can trigger an FDIA episode. Let's not forget that Mary had two healthy children before her father suddenly died and then she lost her third child. We've talked about Mary Beth's history of depression and her own deprivation of parental love and affection. Also, many of those with this illness have borderline personality disorder, or BPD. As we've spoken about in other episodes, BPD is a personality disorder that involves irrational fear of abandonment and strong and unstable emotional reactions. Those that have BPD can be dangerous to themselves and others. It is not at all unusual for people with this disorder to also have narcissistic personality disorder. A narcissist's primary focus in life is of themselves and being recognized. And what better way to draw attention to themselves than to be seriously ill or have a very sick or dead child. But I'm not going to let Mary Beth off the hook by just proclaiming that she suffers from a mental disorder. As you know, I have very broad parameters for bizarre or unusual behavior, but only if no one gets hurt. Obviously, that does not apply to Mary Beth Tinning, who had nine children and one by one after they die, gets pregnant very soon after. Good contraception was available in those days, and they could have easily prevented having more children. However, I don't think Mary Beth had any interest at all in preventing a pregnancy. She simply had no interest in raising her offspring. You've heard me say it before, behavior of any kind, good or bad, occurs because it is reinforced. What I mean by that is the individual gets something out of whatever their behavior was. Doing it either made them feel good in some way, turned them on, or resulted in them getting something that they wanted. Although it was Mary Beth who murdered her children, let's not forget about their father, Joseph. I think he was either the dumbest man on the planet or Joseph was an enabler for Mary Beth's murderous behavior. Why do I think that? After she tried to poison him, he knew that she was dangerous, but he did nothing. He did not go to the police or even quietly leave her. He stayed and kept getting her pregnant. Friends who attended the funerals pointed out that he wore the same suit for every funeral and would sit in silence each time, turning a blind eye. There was only one occasion that he seemed to disagree. The couple fostered a little girl before they adopted their son, and Joseph became close to her. When Mary Beth found out she was pregnant again, she returned the foster child to the orphanage rather than adopt her. Was that because she became jealous that the little girl would get more attention and love from Joseph? We don't know. But one of the reasons that 
FDIA occurs is, quote, a need for attention and sympathy from doctors, nurses, and other professionals. Some experts believe that it isn't just the attention that's gained from the so-called illness of the child that drives this behavior, but also the satisfaction in deceiving individuals whom they consider to be more important and powerful than themselves. Mary Beth murdered nine children in 14 years. It's a good thing she did not fool the last set of medical professionals that treated her children, or the number of victims might have continued to grow. Dr. Roy Meadow, the doctor who coined the term Munchausen syndrome by proxy, had a law that he lived by. One sudden infant death is a tragedy. Two is suspicious. And three is murder until proven otherwise. In 1985, the hospital where Tammy Lynn had passed away called the police to report a suspicious death. An astute nurse noticed Mary Beth, who had run into the ER screaming for help while carrying her unconscious child, minutes later gazing into her compact mirror and preening her hair, while five or six doctors and nurses were desperately trying to resuscitate her daughter. When the chief of police in Schenectady heard about the number of mysterious deaths in the Tinning family, he went to see the district attorney. The DA called the chief pathologist at the hospitals where the Tinning children had died to arrange an autopsy for Tammy Lynn. The pathologist could find no evidence of a metabolic disorder that was presumed to have killed the biological tinning children. Infants that suffer from a metabolic illness do not die suddenly. There is a normal process where the child is sick and shows a struggle with digestion or some other difficulty. The senior pathologist officially wrote the cause of death as suffocation with a soft object. A baby's airway is so narrow that suffocation can happen within seconds and be almost undetectable. On February 4, 1986, New York State troopers interrogated Mary Beth for seven hours. The lead officer, who also happened to be friends with Mary Beth's family, confronted her very gently with the fact that it was not statistically possible for nine babies in the same family to die of natural causes. Mary Beth broke down and confessed that she had smothered Tammy Lynn, Nathan, and Jonathan, but she would not admit to killing the others. Mary Beth was only charged with the murder of Tammy Lynn, since it was believed that the other deaths would be harder to prove. On June 22, 1987, Mary Beth Tinning's trial began in the Schenectady Superior Court. Although Mary Beth recanted her confession, it was still admitted into evidence. The trial took three weeks, after which the jurors deliberated for 19 hours over three days. On July 18, 1987, Mary Beth Tinning was convicted of second-degree murder and showing a depraved indifference to human life. She was sentenced to 20 years to life at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. Mary Beth was denied parole six times. In 2011, Mary Beth told the parole board, quote, I became a damaged and worthless piece of a person. And when my daughter was young, in my state of mind at that time, I just believed that she was going to die also. So I just did it. 
In August of 2018, 75-year-old Mary Beth Tinning was finally granted parole after serving 31 years and released with court supervision for the rest of her life. Her husband, Joseph, was there to pick her up when she was released. She now lives with him in Dwaynesburg, New York. Next week on Killer Psyche, Andrew Kehoe, the originator of mass murders in America. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Anne Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>